أفحكم الجاهلية يبغون ومن أحسن من الله حكما لقوم يوقنون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين we spoke about Al-Hakim and we mentioned uh, in our last halaqa uh, we spoke about Al-Hakim and we spoke about uh, the Hakim being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahkam coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the Quran and through the Sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Ahkam can come through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the Hukum and we said that the Messengers the prophets and the messengers are muballighin they convey the hukum that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed for mankind and i just want to speak a little bit today about opinions because sometimes uh we we see or we hear well this is the opinion of this scholar we hear that this is the statement of this scholar so how does this compare to the statements of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or what is their status uh, compared to that status, we want to speak a little bit about that today, and then if we have time, if you guys feel like it, we'll go on to the issue of taklif. Um, so when it comes to the opinions from imams and mujtahids, then we should know that they are not musharri'een. They are not musharri'een. They cannot legislate. Imams cannot legislate. Mujtahideen cannot legislate. Ulama cannot legislate. Fuqaha cannot legislate. And they do not make up ahkam of their own. If he's a, a true scholar and a true alim and someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he does not create his own ahkam. Uh, rather, they derive from what they under know and understand to reach an assumption or a dhan. So the scholars, when they come up with an opinion, they, they're deriving what they know and understand in order to reach an assumption, which we say is dhan, that had there been a clear nas, had there been clear text from either the Qur'an or the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then this would have been it. So when we say an Imam has an opinion or this uh, Adam through his ijtihad, this is his opinion, the opinion that he derives at through his ijtihad, and we said ijtihad is looking at everything that we have from, from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and everything that we find from the statements of the Sahaba to come up with an opinion. When they come up with their opinion, and we mentioned this before, what they're trying to do is say that had there been an ayah that was revealed or a statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it would have been the statement here. So what they're trying to do is get as close to what they believe would have been the hukum of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the hukum of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is why Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he has a beautiful statement in which he states, Al-Ulama yuwaqbi'oona anillah that the scholars, they sign on behalf of Allah. And what he means by this is that uh, the scholars, they're not trying to establish their own hukum, but what they believe would have been the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or uh, what would have been the hukum had it been found in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is in fact the title of his book, I'lam al-Muwaqqa'een an Rabbil Alameen. So, when a scholar says something is wajib, or a scholar says something is haram, or something is mubah, or, or similar to these, then he is basing this on clear text. Okay? If a scholar says something is wajib, or something is haram, or something is halal, or similar to these statements, he's basing it on a clear text. Meaning, uh, uh, it is either found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it is found from the statements of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is simply relaying the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if he makes these same statements without a clear text, after performing ijtihad, then he is saying that I believe this is the correct hukum, that had it been revealed, this would have been the hukum. Does that make sense? I don't want to lose anyone here. If a scholar is saying something is halal, or something is haram, or something is mubah, or something is, uh, is uh, um, you know, wajib, or, or similar to these statements, he has to have a clear text for it. And we'll mention why in a moment here. But if he isn't saying these, or if he's saying that this is my opinion, then he's saying that 
had there been a clear text, then this opinion in, through his ijtihad is what he believes would have been the hukum that had it been revealed. <coughs> okay? Does that make sense? We're okay? Their conclusion cannot be absolute. The opinions of scholars, their opinions cannot be absolute. Because they're scholars, they're men, they make mistakes, they can be correct or they could be wrong. But uh, the only absolute hukum is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot make mistakes. Scholars can make mistakes and this is why we say that their opinion is not absolute. But when we say that the opinion or what comes through the Quran or what comes through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is the haq, this is absolute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot make mistakes. As for statements that come from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we say that this, uh, uh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ma'soom. So if he makes a mistake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will correct his mistake. He will not leave the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a state of, of, of uh, in a state of, of being incorrect because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had done this billah, then there would be uh, misguidance for the ummah how, would, uh, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leave the entire ummah upon misguidance by not correcting um, a mistake from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa so we mentioned last week that the messengers they can make mistakes but we say that they're ma'sumeen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrects them. That if they make a mistake, we'll have an ayah that comes down, or Jibreel alayhi salam will come down, and he'll mention uh, or, or correct what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had said, or the action that he did. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave him in this state. Okay? But the ulama, then they can make mistakes. And this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, إِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكَمُ فَاجْتَهَدْ ثُمَّ أَصَابَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا وَإِذَا حَكَمَ الْحَاكَمُ فَاجْتَهَدْ that the hakim, the, the judge, or the one who's judging in a matter, if he performs his ijtihad and he's correct, he will have two rewards for his uh, judgment. But if he judges, he, if he performs ijtihad and he judges and he makes a mistake, he gets an ajr. <coughs> he gets one reward. So the one who is correct will get two rewards, the one who is incorrect will still get a reward. But what we want to take out of this is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is emphasizing that they can make mistakes. That the ulama can make mistakes. But they still get a reward for their opinion. And this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So the opinion of a mujtahid, though he is trying to derive a hukum that is based on what he feels would have been the hukum of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that had, uh, he has to um, if it is a hukum, if he's saying that it is wajib, or it is haram, or it is halal, then he has to have a clear text for it. Because if he is saying that, if he doesn't have a clear text for it, then what is he doing? He's attributing something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If he says that this is uh, haram, you know, for example, someone will go and say that, um, you know, we mentioned like amongst the druz, the mulukhiya is haram, right? They, they say mulukhiya is haram. What is their uh, uh, for that? If, if by, by saying, uh, what is their text for that? Well, they don't have a clear text for that. Does this, do you find this in the Quran? Do you find it in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? But they, no, it's not. But when they attribute the statement that this is haram or something is halal, then they're attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and they don't have something, and they've committed a lie or attributed uh, a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or committed a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so what they have to say if they come up with an opinion they have to say Hada ra'yi. this is my opinion scholars have to say this is my opinion right because they can be refuted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be refuted the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa cannot be refuted right so they have to say this is my opinion and this is why Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he was asked, the man came to him and he said, إِذَا خَالَفَ كَلَامُكَ كَلَامِ uh, كلام الله. Um, if, if your statement, we find it differs in the statement of Allah, he said, دَعُوا كَلَامِ لِكَلَامِ اللَّهِ Leave my statement for the statement of Allah. And then they said, إِذَا خَالَفَ كَلَامُكَ كَلَامَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ 
that if your statement, if we find your statement differs from the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, دعو كلامي لكلامي رسول الله. Leave my opinion or leave my statement for the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the man asked him, إذا خالف كلامك كلام أصحاب رسول الله that if we find your statement differs from the statement of the Sahaba of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah Alayhi he replied and he said دعو كلامي لكلامي أصحاب رسول الله فإنهم أعلم بالتنزيل leave my statements for the statements of the Sahaba because they have more knowledge of what was revealed or why things were revealed and then they said إذا خالف كلامك كلام فلان and they began to mention like people like Sufyan al-Thawri or uh, al awzai and others he said نحن رجال وهم رجال ما وافق الحق فخذوه that we are men and they are men whatever you find closest to the truth then this is what you take okay and of course we have this uh, the famous statement of Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi who says ما من أحد إلا يؤخذ منه قوله ويرد إلا قول صاحب هذا القبر that there is not a man from amongst us except that their statements are accepted and refuted except for the companion of this grave referring to the Prophet ﷺ and he was pointing to the grave of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ فَكُلُّهُ مَقْبُولُ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ Everything that comes from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is to be taken, is accepted ﷺ So we have to make it clear that when the opinion of a mujtahid is refuted it is not refuting the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Okay? If, if we're, if let's say an Imam comes with an opinion and someone refutes that opinion, we're not saying he's refuting the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're refuting the statement of an alim or a mujtahid. And um, it is simply refuting an ijtihadi opinion of a man who tried his best to reach a hukum he believed was closest to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants from his servants. So what are the benefits that we can understand from the Hakim being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a number of benefits that we're going to look at. The first is any sort of hukum must first be sought from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and from the Sahaba who understood the teachings and preserved the Sunnah. So the first thing that we should know is to seek ahkam. Ahkam should first be sought from the Quran, this is the first source, and and with it the Sunnah. You can't separate the Quran from the Sunnah, nor the Sunnah from the Quran. They have to be taken together. And after that, then we should look at the opinions of the Sahaba and look at what the Sahaba uh, said, because as we mentioned, as Abu Hanifa even said, "Hum a'lamu bil that they have more knowledge of what was revealed. And um, the second thing that we should know that or after exhausting all of these only then can a person turn to his opinion and try to derive uh, a hukum uh, from his own opinion or come up with an opinion with regards to a matter so if he can't find it in the Quran or the Sunnah or from the statements of the Sahaba then he should use whatever resources he has in his own means to derive his own opinion second when understanding or deriving a hukum it is not permissible to say that this is halal or this is haram without having clear proof as this is, as we mentioned, attributing a hukum to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when in fact it wasn't a hukum from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلِسِنَتِكُمُ الْكَذِبِ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahl, chapter 16, ayah number 116, do not say about what your tongues put forth falsely. This is halal and this is haram. Okay, so don't say this is halal and this is haram falsely, meaning you don't have a text for it. So as to invent lies against Allah. Truly those who invent lies against Allah will never prosper. Okay, so a mujtahid has to find clear proof for these statements. Otherwise, he should say, هذا رأيي, this is my opinion. Or he should say, أحب كذا أو أكره كذا that I, I like doing this or I prefer doing this. And Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, he mentions um, in, in the same book, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden attributing statements to him without knowledge in giving fatawas or judgment and has made it from one of the greatest things forbidden. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
قل إنما حرم ربي الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن والإثم والبغي وبغير الحق وأن تشركوا بالله ما لم ينزل به سلطانا وأن تقولوا على الله ما لا تعلمون الله سبحانه وتعالى says in سورة الأعراف chapter 7 ayah number 33 say O Muhammad uh, the, Allah سبحانه وتعالى is commanding Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to say the things that my Lord has indeed forbidden are al-fawahish, whether committed openly or secretly, sins of all kinds, unrighteousness, oppression, joining partners with Allah for which he has given no authority, and saying things about Allah which you have no knowledge. Right? So saying that this is halal or this is haram, and you have no knowledge about this matter, then you have attributed falsely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continues to say, وَهَذَا بَيَانٌ مِنْهُ سُبْحَانَهُ أَنَّهُ لَا يَجُوزُ لِلْعَبْدِ أَنْ يَقُولْ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ إِلَّا بِمَا عَلِمَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ حَلَّهُ وَحَرَّمَهُ And he says, this is clear proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is not permissible for a servant to say, this is halal and this is haram, except in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed as being halal and haram. And there is a word of caution that Ibn Qayyim mentions as well. <coughs> and that is the leniency that some people have, especially those who follow madhahib um, uh, closely, where they might falsely attribute a statement to the imam of the madhahib. So for example, um, if uh, the imam, uh, an imam of the madhahib, or even a scholar within that madhahib says, akrahu hadha, or akrahu kadha, or uhibbu uh, you know, I, I like this or I dislike this. And then someone says um, falsely or changing the words saying, he said this is haram or he said this is halal. Um, you know, for, uh, for example, Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, he disliked that a person would um, perform the adhan with lahan. You know, like beautifying the adhan with, with his voice, like making it melodious with his voice. He disliked it. He said that this is, takes away from the ta'lim of, of the words that a person is saying, and rather he is um, making it close to ghina, right? That he's, uh, he's taking away from the glorifying of, of these words, and he's making it almost like singing. So Imam Malik disliked that someone does it. So for a person to come and say, Imam Malik said it's haram to, to do lahan when, when performing the adhan, to beautify your voice when you're doing the adhan, then what has he done? He's attributed something to Imam Malik which he didn't say, more importantly saying Imam Malik said that this is haram, as though there is a clear text from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is why it's very important that even when someone is attributing something to a scholar, he has to be careful in the words that he chooses, right? So you can't say that uh, Imam Malik said this was haram when in fact he never said it was haram but he disliked it, right? Because um, someone might then come and not go and look and, and search for himself might come and say, Imam Malik you know, said this is haram and he has no clear text for this or nothing from the Qur'an or nothing from the Sunnah uh, for something like this, right? So this is why it's extremely important uh, to do this. Does that make sense? Inshallah. So, uh, um, when a person uh, speaks about um, a hukum or is giving his opinion, he should also refrain from saying, Hadha hukmullah that this is the hukum, the legislation of Allah. So a person, um, and, and the evidence we have for this is rather from a lengthy hadith that we have from Buraida <coughs> and he's going, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is commanding his leaders of his armies, before he goes out, he, was, he would give them nasiha. And one of the things that he said to them was, وَإِذَا حَاصَرْتَ أَهْلَ حِصْنٍ فَأَرَادُوكَ أَنْ تُنْزِلَهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِ اللَّهِ فَلَا تُنْزِلْهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِ اللَّهِ وَلَكِنْ أَنْزِلْهُمْ عَلَى حُكْمِكَ فَإِنَّكَ لَا تَدْرِي أَتُصِيبُ حُكْمَ اللَّهِ فِيهِمْ أَمْ لَا That if you surround the people of a fortress and they seek from you to allow them to exit their forts according to the judgment of Allah, then don't allow them to exit based on the judgment of Allah, but allow them to exit based on your judgment. For you do, you do not know if you have acted according to the judgment of Allah or not. So never say that this is the hukm of Allah, rather say that this is my hukm. This is in Sahih Muslim. And similarly, when a writer was writing the judgment of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he wrote, هذا ما أرى هذا ما أرى الله أمير المؤمنين عمر that this is what Allah has shown the commander of the faithful Umar and Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله عنه he said لا تقل هذا 
don't say this ولكن قل هذا ما رأى أمير المؤمنين عمر بن الخطاب he said this is what عمر الخطاب has has uh, has uh, seen um, and this uh, so he said don't say that this is what Allah has shown عمر but rather say this is what عمر بن الخطاب has seen to be the judgment and this is narrated by البيهقي in a Sunan al-Kubra uh, with a Sahih Isnad. Okay? The third thing that we take from this is if anyone makes a statement when he attributes to a form of legislation or which he attributes to a form of legislation, then he is not bound by it. So if it is a statement of a scholar and you know it's not falling back on a clear nas or a clear text, his own statement, like he says, I dislike something like this or I like something like this, you're not bound by it. Okay? A statement of a scholar, you're not bound by. If it's a hukum from Allah, or if it's a judgment from Allah or His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you're bound by it. فَإِنَّ الشَّرْعَ لَا يَثْبُتْ بِأَقْوَالِ الرِّجَالِ That Sharia is not established by the statements of men. It comes from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Um, and the only exception to this is if it comes, if it is an order that comes from a king or a judge or a leader that has been put in charge of the people, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ya ayyuha al-ladina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa uli al-amri minkum." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger, and those of you who are in authority." So those who are put in charge of a people, an Amir. Uh, the leader of a jaysh or something like that, if he says, I want everyone to go into the battlefield, or if he says, I want everyone to fall back, you have to obey him in these matters, right? Though it is not, we, we don't say it's tashri'ah and it's not hukum, but we say that he has to be obeyed because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us, to, uh, uh, commanded us to obey him. And similarly, because when it comes to this, that we see many leaders who command people to do things that are without a doubt haram, right? But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us لا طاعة في معصية إنما الطاعة في المعروف That there is no ta'a in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rather, obedience is only in that which is known That which is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger And this actually statement comes from uh, uh, an incident that actually took place during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ali Rabbi Ta'anihu, he narrates this hadith uh, and this is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and others and that is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he sent a jaysh, he sent an army and he put in charge of them a man from the Ansar and some of the people said that this is Abd, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi but he's in fact not from the Ansar, he is from uh, the Muhajireen, he's in fact one of the people who made the Hijra to Al-Habasha, so it is not him, but in any case, uh, this is weak, those who attribute it to him, but rather it is a man from the Ansar whom the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi put in charge of the Jaysh, he put him in charge. So an incident happened between them while they were out there, and he said to them, أَلَيْسَ أَمَرَكُمُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَن تُطِيعُونَنِي that didn't and tutiuni that didn't uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam command you to obey me and they said bara they said of course yes we were commanded to obey you he's the leader of the jaysh he's the leader of the army so they have to follow him so he said fajma'u li hataba gather for me some wood and they went and they gathered wood for him and then he said awqidu uh, nara you know start a fire from from this wood that you gathered so they went and, and they started the fire and then after they started the fire, he said, Idkhuluha, jump into the fire. So he commanded his, his soldiers to go and jump into the fire. And they didn't know what to do. Some of them wanted to jump in, and others began to hold uh, others back, saying, you know, Faranna ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min al -nar. We fled from the fire going to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning we fled the hellfire, so now we, we should jump into the hellfire. So they didn't know what to do. And then they came back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they informed him of what he, of what this commander had done. And there's different opinions why they did it. Some said that he was testing them, some said that he was just joking with them, Allah Ta'ala A'lam. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ دَخَلُوهَا مَا خَرَجُوا مِنْهَا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That had they entered the fire, then they would not have left it until يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, الطَّاعَةُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ or الطَّاعَةُ فِي الْمَعْرُوفِ That obedience is only in that which is good, not in that which is a ma'asiyah. 
And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma ala al-mar' al-muslim as-sam'u wa ta'a fi ma ahabba wa kariha illa an yu'mar bi ma'asiyya fa in umira bi ma'asiyyatin fala sam'a wa la ta'a That um, it is incumbent upon a Muslim t- uh, to hear and obey in that which he likes and that which he dislikes. And except if it is a command to do something that is sinful, um, because if he is commanded to do something sinful, then there is no hearing or obeying in this matter. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Okay, so these are some of the things that we want to take away from this, inshallah. Any questions? No? How are you guys feeling? Do you want to keep going or? Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. Um, we'll, we'll start maybe the next section, but we won't go into it too long. But now that we know who Al-Hakim is, we want to, inshallah, speak about who is obliged by the Ahkam. Al-Mahkum Ali. Right? Because we have Ahkam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have Ahkam from His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But who is obligated by these Ahkam? And this is also referred to as Al-Mukallaf. Al-Mukallaf, okay? The one who is obliged by the ahkam. Now, takallafa literally means to burden with something, to be burdened with something. Like, um, you know, for example, if I give Khalid one box to carry and then I give him another box on top of it and I put another box and another box on top of it, I'm burdening him, burdening him with boxes, right? Uh, this is taklif. I'm overburdening him with that which he won't be able to bear. Despite how big he is, he'll, he'll eventually... <laughs> Drop, uh, drop whatever I'm throwing at him, right? So this is taklif. And Anas ibn Malik, عنه, he narrated that they were with Umar ibn Khattab, عنه, and he said, Nuhina an takalluf, that we were prohibited from taklif. We were prohibited from overburdening ourselves from taklif, from this issue of taklif that we're speaking about. And here what he's referring to is asking questions after questions after questions about that which really there's no need to ask about it. If the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left it without explaining it, then don't delve into it and don't go asking questions after after questions. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala informs His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, قُلْ مَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُتَكَلِّفِينَ That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commanded His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, I do not ask you for reward, nor am I from those who impose burden. This is in Surah Sa'd, uh, chapter 38, ayah number 86. So in this specific ayah, the Prophet ﷺ is commanded to tell the people that he doesn't add anything to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to overburden the people. Uh, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a hukum by which mankind is to apply, then the Prophet ﷺ will not add on top of that in burdening. So if takalluf is forbidden in the religion, then why do we say that someone to whom the Sharia applies for is mukallaf? Why do we say that he is burdened by something? And this is because there is in fact taklif in the deen. Okay? There is in fact uh, taklif in the deen. There is a type of burdening, but it's not overburdening. And what do we mean by this? Well, we find this explained in the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not overburden someone with more than what he can bear. So there is a type of burdening. There is a type of um, addition that people have to do or things that people have to do that people who don't care about the deen don't do. For example, the Muslimin, they have to pray five times a day. Those who don't care from the kuffar, they don't pray five times a day. They don't feel like they're burdened by this act of ibadah. We don't find it as a burden. We find it as a means of worshipping and coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they see it as a burden. But the fact is, we are given something to do that they don't do, that they refuse to do, but we do it. Siyam, same thing that comes to Siyam. And same thing that comes to other aspects of the Sharia. If a person, for example, can't stand up and pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't force him to stand up and pray. He allows him, gives him the concession of sitting down and praying. And even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when he would pray the nawafil, he would pray them sitting down sometimes, right? But, uh, and if a person can't even do it sitting down, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows him to lay down and pray, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't force a person to do these things. If a person can't find water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the rukhsah of, of tayammum. He still has to perform uh, tahara, right? He's still burdened if you want, or uh, um, he has this 
act that's placed upon him that he has to do, but it is not overburdening, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a person more than what they're able to bear. So there is taklif in the deen. And we spoke about earlier in these lessons how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and that he has a right to demand from his servants whatever he wants. And when it comes to the ins and the jinn, from mankind and the jinn, then they are mukallifin, obliged by the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we said one of the purposes of the sharia is ibadah, right? One of the purposes of the sharia is ibadah, to test the servants, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created the jinn and mankind except to worship. So mankind and jinn, they have to worship and this is an act of uh, ibadah. The impositions of the sharia following them is an act of ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing his servants. So what about the malaika? Are they mukallifin or not? What do we think? Oh. We, we, a few, no, huh? No. Uh, La? The answer is they are. The malaika are mukallifin. Why do we say this? Because we said that um, taklif is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands something from his creation that they have to do, right? The malaika, are they commanded to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? They are commanded, right? Um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them, or they have duties. We know that from the malaika, they have duties. We have uh, some malaika who, are, who carry the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have some malaika who guard the hellfire. We have some malaika who watch over the gates of Jannah. We have some malaika who will be pulling Jahannam uh, on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the malaika to do what? To make sujood to Adam alayhi salam out of respect. وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَاكَةِ تَسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا Right? He commanded them with sujood and they made sujood. Uh, so they are mukallifin by the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them with things and they have to do it. And they are in constant worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِهِ وَيُسَبِّحُونَهُ وَلَهُ يَسْجُدُونَ That indeed those who are with your Lord, meaning the malaika, are not prevented by arrogance from his worship. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they glorify him and they prostrate to him. So they are mukallifin, um, the malaika. However, the difference between them and mankind is that, uh, and the jinn, is that they cannot disobey. So they're mukallifin in the sense that they have to do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them, but they're different from mankind and the jinn in that they can't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They still have to do everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them to do, and this is why we say that they're mukallifin, but they are, um, they can't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ma amarahum wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. That they do not disobey Allah in what He commands, and they do as they are commanded. Does that make sense? Okay. What about animals? They are not mukallifin. Why? What's that? They have no aql. They have no aql. They have no aql. That's the difference between animals. So uh, animals, they have no aql, right? They they don't they don't have reasoning, the intellect to to come up with their own judgments. They still, يعني يسبحون الله سبحانه وتعالى like the mountains and the sky and things like that, but they don't have aql, right? So this is one of the difference between um, the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So um, the topic of taklif itself, then it falls under two categories of ahkam that apply to the mukallaf. Ahkam i'tiqadiya and ahkam far'i, okay? So taklif falls into two categories, ahkam that are اعتقادية and أحكام that are فرعي and we'll define these two right now when it comes to أحكام أحكام اعتقادية then what do we think it means أحكام that have to do with what إيمان إيمان belief عقيدة right اعتقادية has to do with belief it has to do with uh, with uh, our uh, it has to do with uh, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. from aqidah, right? 
Now, ahkam i'tiqadiyya, it is, these are ahkam or things that we are told about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about the deen, about the malaika, about these things that we have to believe. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, taklif. Taklif in that we have, we are told these things to believe and we have to believe it and everyone has to believe it, right? When it comes to ahkam far'i, al-hukm uh, al-shar'i al-far'i, then this is defined as qitab Allah alladhi yata'allaq bi af'al al-ibad bil-talb aw al-takhir aw al-wadr that the message of Allah that relates to the actions the message of Allah that relates to actions of the servants in demands or choices or choices or wadr what do we mean by wadr? Wadr means it is a type of hukum that we're going to deal with that are either asbab or ashrat or uh, uh, things that affect the hukum or things that affect the legislation. So we'll speak about that. So what we mean by this, these are ahkam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that relates to the actions of the ibad that have to do with uh, things that are commands like this is uh, like wajib, you have to do this, or this is haram, you can't do this. Or choices, takhir, where a person has a choice in the matter, do this or don't do this, or wala, which are things that, as we mentioned, we'll go into detail a lot more inshallah, but this has to do with things that are, um, uh, you know, either conditions for something else or reasons for something else. <laughs> so as for the first category of, of, uh, of taklif, when we say that it comes to al-ahkam al-i'tiqadiyya, when it comes to al-ahkam al-i'tiqadiyya, then we don't need to focus on this very much. This is more an issue to do with aqeed, and I know Sheikh uh, like he went into this quite a bit of detail, and he's still going into it in, in his uh, lessons. But if we are here listening to this, then we already know that whatever Allah and His Messenger has have revealed or have brought to us, then we have to follow it, we have to obey it without question. But the two categories really work together. They're hand in hand. Someone can't only follow the ahkam al-i'tiqadiyya and reject the ahkam al-shara' al-far'i, right? You have to have both. Because really when you follow the ahkam of legislation, it proves the belief. Someone can just, you can't, someone can't just say, well, I believe in Allah, but I don't pray and I don't fast. I don't believe I have to do that, but I do believe in Allah. We say, no, if you believe in Allah, then proof of that belief is in your a'mal, right? And this is why many of uh, um, the aqeed of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah is that the iman is um, the belief in Allah and it is, uh, it's with the tongue and it is with the, uh, the heart and it is with the actions as well. You can't separate them from, from one another. This is all part of iman, right? But the difference between these two categories, we're going to speak about this briefly and we'll inshallah finish with this, is that when it comes to the first category, whether you're Muslim or not, when we're speaking about ahkam uh, i'tiqadiyya, whether you're Muslim or not, this is taklif upon this person. He has to believe it. Whether you're Muslim or not, you have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he has told us about himself and his deen. And uh, those who reject it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, O Muhammad, وسلم, my Lord pays attention to you only because of your invocation to him. But now you have indeed denied him, meaning the kuffar, they have indeed denied him. So the torment will be yours <coughs> forever. So the kuffar are without a doubt mukallafeen with regards to the first category. So we say that Muslims, kuffar, everyone is obligated by the first category, the category of belief, taklif, i'tiqadiyya, ahkam i'tiqadiyya, everyone is obligated by this. Now, when it comes to the second category, the category of actions, are the, we know obviously the Muslims, they're mukallafeen by this, they have to follow these things, the ahkam of the sharia, what about the kuffar? Do they have to pray? Do they have to fast? Do they have to give zakat? Do they have to adhere to birr al-walidain? What do we say about that, the kuffar? No, no. Yes, no? no? They have to be Muslim first. 
They have to be Muslims order, first. Order to do this yeah. action. Everyone agrees? But if you if you don't have the first, <laughs> if you don't believe in him, do you still have to pray? They don't. No. no. Yes, they no. don't worship, but they make they give sadaqa. If you don't believe, then how are you going to follow? Because they're not getting the edges for anyways, right? Okay. There's two opinions from the Usuriyin with regards to this, and both of them have their evidences. So some of the Usuriyin, they said that they are still obligated, or uh, some of them said that they're not obligated by the ahkam of the Sharia, just as, uh, as you mentioned, because they have to have uh, Iman first, right? They have to have Iman. So for example, amongst the Fuqaha, we know that some acts of Ibadah can't be performed if you don't meet some conditions for it, right? So we said that wudu is a condition for the salat, right? If someone doesn't have uh, wudu, then he can't pray. He doesn't meet the conditions. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضى That the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept the salat of one of you who has broke, uh, who has broken wind until he makes wudu. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari, right? From the hadith of Abu Huraira. So they say that if wudu, for example, is a condition for the salat, then what about iman, which is a condition for any act of ibadah? It is a shart, right? If you don't even meet this first condition, then how can you be expected to meet these other conditions? So even if he did pray, it wasn't going to be accepted from him. And even if he did fast, it wasn't going to be accepted from him. And if he paid zakat, it wasn't going to be accepted from him. So they said, so if it's not going to be accepted from him anyway, then why should he do it? And their evidence for this is also the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which says, وَقَدِبْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, ayah 23, and we shall turn to whatever deeds they did, meaning يعني, the kuffar, whatever deeds they did from deeds, we will turn it into scattered dust. So even whatever deeds they did, it is all going to be scattered dust on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because they didn't have what? Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So they said, since it's not going to be accepted from them, then even if they did do it, they're not, uh, they won't be um, rewarded for it, even if they did do it, so they're not obligated to do it. So this is one opinion from the Usuliyyah. The second opinion is that they are still obligated by it. So a kafir. Even if he doesn't believe in Allah, he's going to be punished for not praying as well. So not only will he be punished for not believing in Allah, he's going to be punished for not praying. And then there's going to be punishment for not fasting. And a punishment on top of that for not giving zakat. So the punishments continue to add on top of one another, punishment over punishment for everything that they didn't do from the Sharia. And their evidence for this is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> where he says in the Quran, كل نفس بما كسبت رهينة إلا أصحاب اليمين في جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين ما سلككم في سطر that um, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions in the Quran that every person is a pledge for what he has earned except for those of the right in gardens they will ask one another about the mujrimin so those who are in Jannah or who are in um, the gardens of of Jannah they are going to be asking about the mujrimin. Who are the mujrimin? We'll come to see, we'll define this in a moment. But they're going to ask about the mujrimin or ask the mujrimin, what has caused you to enter saqar? What's saqar? No, 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 no. jahannam, right? What has put you into nar jahannam? They are going to say, qalu lam naku min al musallin wa lam naku nut'im al miskin وَكُنَّا نَخُوذُ مَعَ الْخَاضِعِينَ وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ حَتَّى أَتَانَ الْيَقِينَ What's their reply going to be? They replied with acts of ibadat. They said, we weren't from those who used to pray, nor were we from those who used to feed the poor, nor, uh, and we used to enter into vain talk with those who engaged in it, meaning talk which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes. And here they say, وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ So it means they are what? They used to deny the day of recompense means they're what? Yeah, kuffar. kuffar. They're kuffar, these people, right? Mujrimin here, they're kuffar. They didn't believe. This is taklif i atiqadiya, right? This is taklif i atiqadiya. They had to believe in Yawm al-Din, but they didn't believe in Yawm al-Din. So they became, they're kuffar, right? 
and so they say we didn't pray and we didn't feed the uh, we didn't feed the poor and we engaged in vain talk and we denied the day of recompense hatta atana al-yaqeen until there came to us that which is certain meaning death right so this is the first evidence that they mention is that they mention uh, you know the, the acts of ibadat that they didn't do they mentioned that you know we're in Jahannam because we didn't pray and we didn't fast or we didn't feed the poor. So they mentioned these, and their evidence as well is that there are categories of adab in Jahannam. Not all disbelievers are equal. For example, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, kafaru wa saddu an zidnahum adab an adab bima kanu yufsidun." That those who disbelieved and hindered men from the path of Allah. For them, we will add torment over torment because they used to spread corruption. Um, so we have um, categories of disbelievers. Some who are going to be in the lowest depths of the hellfire, such as the munafiqeen. And we have others who are going to be in, uh, by lowest I mean deepest depths of hellfire. And we have some who are going to be at the shallowest point of, uh, of hellfire, such as Abu Talib. Abu Talib didn't fall under this category. He didn't uh, push people away from the deen, um, but rather he prevented people from harming the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and even the Muslimin, right? So as, as so we know in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that uh, his uncle Abu Talib is in the shallowest depths of Jahannam because of what he used to do, right? He's still in Jahannam, he's still a disbeliever, but his punishment isn't as bad as the punishment of Fir'aun, for example, or the punishment of the Munafiqeen, or those who fought against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's different levels of punishment, and depending on that which they did do or didn't do, it will increase upon them, and this is the evidence of the second people. What's the right opinion? We're not gonna, <laughs> we don't know. We leave this, this is a matter really um, for scholars to, to discuss, and we don't really have both opinions are really valid and um, they both have their evidences for it, so we don't really say which is right and which is which is wrong in this particular matter. What are those two verses that you just used as evidence for the Oh, so uh, the first one is from Surah Al Muddatha um, about their acts of ibadat that they used to, uh, um, that they mentioned. This is chapter 74, ayat 38 to 47. And the ayah about their punishment over punishment or torment over torment, this is from Surah An Nahd, chapter 16, ayah number 88. Any questions? We'll, we'll stop with this because there's a lot. Um, when it comes to taklif, there's going to be a lot that we're going to discuss, inshallah, because there's mawana uh, uh, as well for taklif. So some people might. You might, they might meet all the conditions, but they're still exempt from the Sharia somehow, right? Or uh, exempt from a hukum rather, not from the entire Sharia. Um, so we'll speak about that and, and other categories, inshallah. <laughs>